Thank you, my friends. This is a glorious day of celebration, but I would be remiss not to begin my remarks today by noting it is also the 228th day of hostages from Israel being held in captivity. We stand with them, with all of those who are suffering in Israel today. I want to, in that context also, though, pivot to be able to celebrate and to thank. We are commanded to live our lives and to celebrate even in the face of tragedy and challenge. So I begin by thanking Dr. Jeffrey Herbst, the president of the university, and Harold Mazur, the chair of the board and the board members of AJU's Board of Governors. Thank you very much for all you do on our behalf. It is my pleasure to thank the Ziegler Advisory Board Chair, Debbie Kaner Goldich, and all of the members of the Ziegler Advisory Board. Thank you also for your stalwart solidarity. We are blessed to be part of the conservative Masorti movement in Judaism, and we have many of its august leaders with us here today. Rabbi Stuart Vogel, past president of the Rabbinical Assembly, Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal, the CEO of the Rabbinical Assembly and United Synagogue. We have members of the Cantor's Assembly, Mrs. Marilyn Berkowitz, who is the vice president of Torah Fund for Women's League for Conservative Judaism, is with us here today. Rabbi Noam Raucher, who is the executive director of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. We have members and leaders of the Jewish Educators Assembly, Solomon Schechter Association. Dr. Stephen Arnoff of the Fuchsburg Center of Jerusalem has flown all the way from Israel to be with us here today. I thank all of you who work with us to be able to bring a Torah of resilience and authenticity into the world. Of course, a rabbinical school is only as great as its faculty, which is why this is indeed a great rabbinical school. I'd like to ask the members of the AJU and Ziegler faculty full and part-time to please rise so we can thank you. The Ziegler School has not only a remarkable faculty, but a great administrative team. Rector Rabbi Elliot Dorf, Assistant Dean, <laughs> Rabbi Samuel Rosenbaum, Associate Dean, Rabbi Cheryl Peretz, thank you all for the work that you do. There are several Ziegler alumni who are with us here today who have already stood as members of the Rabbinical Assembly. But our deepest thanks today belongs to the parents and grandparents and family and close friends of the ordinands. And I'd like to ask this year's ordination class to please rise and join with me in saluting those wonderful people. I have been thinking for some time about what message I would like to share with you at this moment. Reference has already been made to the ways that we live in a bleak and difficult time. And as always, we address life somewhere between the constraints and opportunities that reality presents to us and then the choices that we make in the face of that reality. I think about that in the light of the Torah portion we'll be reading this week, which begins, interestingly enough, with a sort of pivot. Vaidaber Adonai el Moshe Bahar Sinai Lemor. God speaks to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Daber el Bnei Yisrael v'amarta alehem ki tavo'u 
אל הארץ אשר אני נותן לכם, ושבת הארץ שבת לאדוני. Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come to the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to the Lord. The rabbis of old ask an interesting question about this juxtaposition. Ma'inyan Shemitah lahar Sinai. What does the revelation at Mount Sinai have to do with the year of keeping your field to lie fallow during the Shemitah year, during the sabbatical year? When I was in rabbinical school, slightly after the Iron Age, I was taught that these verses reflect the opposition between the natural world and civilization, that Shemitah has to do with our living in harmony with nature, and that Mount Sinai is an artificial removal from nature for the sake of morality. But I've come to believe that seeing these in opposition is, in fact, a signal mistake of Western civilization, that we never step outside of nature, that our morality itself is an evolutionary product that we as mammals bubbled up from the experiences of all of our ancestors going all the way back, and that it's not so much nature versus civilization or creation versus revelation. But hey, guys, you find yourself living in a natural world that you did not choose or create. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to make it beautiful and blessed and joyous? How are you going to make it possible so that we and our loved ones and those who come after us will be able to thrive in this world? It seems to me that Shemitah is what we do. to keep nature vibrant, and that Sinai is the guidebook for us about how we make good choices in the world. And we as a community, you as rabbis, we must, despite the challenges, continue to lean into curiosity, possibility, compassion, and love. As rabbis, you will face mighty constraints. You will step into communities that already have a history. They already have a culture. They already have wounds and challenges and traumas. You emerge into a society that has trauma at every turn. And we live in an age full of fiscal and existential threats that leave us all in a brutal, difficult place. Back when we were emerging from the primal sludge, we developed a fear or fight response. And that served us well. If you're looking at a saber-toothed tiger, this is no time for nuance. But the challenge is that we now live eternally in fight or flight. We are drowning in anxiety and tension and despair, heightened by social media, heightened by the news, whipped up by a community that is so viciously partisan that it becomes a sin to listen to someone with whom you don't agree. And so how do we, in such a time, carve out a path of life? The Torah makes a command of us, Uvaharta b'chayim, you should choose life. Not because that's self-evident, it's actually hard to do. In a world in which everyone is spoiling for a fight, how do you choose life? How do you stand for love? How do you, in a world of conflict, say that there's another way? There is a way not of weakness, but of strength. And so I want to urge you, my dear new rabbis, and all of us, to remember the words of Joshua, who is echoing the words of his teacher, Moses. Chazak ve'ematz. Al ta'arotz ve'al techat. 
Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Now, I want to point out to you, the bad news is nobody says that to someone who's about to face something pleasant. <laughs> and in the real world, there will be real challenges, and they will be hard. And their greatest danger will not be that you can't overcome them. You will be able to overcome them. But the greatest danger is we are all prone to despair. We are all easily able to become victimized by our own sense of being put upon, that those who are challenging us are assaulting us, and we allow ourselves to be remade in their image. Don't do that. Don't despair. Don't surrender. Don't become remade with the rigidity and the frailty of your enemies. The best way to fight back is to stay broad-hearted, to stay flexible and open and resilient, to be able to affirm their humanity even as you oppose their injustice. And so to you and to all of us, I bless you that this day, celebrating all the Torah you have learned internalized and refashioned, that you are able to step into the world with open and flexible hearts, that you should build communities of care and presence and diversity, that you should reach out beyond our borders to find and to create coalitions of well-meaning people with whom we may differ on important points, but who understand the centrality of affirming humanity as a first place. And in doing that, I bless you and us that you will build in your lives tabernacle, tabernacles of purity and of holiness in which those who are under your care will experience the embrace of angels, and those who are in the outer courtyard will remain there. Shalom. Shalom.